Hello, everyone. So good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries. You should know that by now. What will it take to see revival in 2023? This we are at the end of the year of 2022. Now we got to get used to another number. But what will it take to see revival? You know, we've been the church has been talking about revival for years. Revival's coming. Revival's coming. What will it take for that revival? Well, let's look at some things this morning. Before I give you my answer, I want to ask, I want to ask you, what if? What if? What do I mean by that? I got three examples, and there's many more in the Bible, but I'm going to talk about three in particular. Now, what if the rich young ruler would have given up everything to follow Christ? Would that have brought revival to the nation? Now, what do I mean by that? Some of y'all might know what the story is. Here in Luke 18, it says, Now a certain ruler asked, asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So, first thing Jesus does, he puts him in the proper place about who is good. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Now, Jesus definitely was good, but he came in human form, and he's saying, Hey, only God is good. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. So my question is, what if, what if he would have done what Jesus said? What would have taken place in his life? How would that have affected him, his family, and the rest of the world? You know, it's an interesting story, and it's something that we need to ask ourselves. Now, what will it take for us to see revival in 2023? Well, first off, what is revival? You know, you think about reviving somebody, somebody that's almost dead or someone that has died, and they got to hit them with those electrical paddles and, or CPR. You know, they have to do certain things to try to bring life back into that body. Well, if we look at the world today and we look at the church, are we seeing revival? I think there are souls getting saved. That would be a revival for them. They're coming to life in Jesus' name. There's a certain amount of that kind of revival taking place. Well, what about all over the earth? Well, I just was making mention and asking the question about the nation of Israel. If this rich young ruler would have sold out to Jesus Christ, would that have made a big difference in the nation of Israel? Well, Jesus Christ was there at that time, and they crucified him. So... I doubt if the rich young ruler would have had much more success than Jesus. But he would have had revival within his soul. He would have came to a place of understanding truth. You see, the Holy Spirit would have been upon him. Not in him, but upon him. And, and he would have begun to understand. Jesus would have begun to teach him. And he would have learned what true riches was all about. And revival would have come to his own soul. He would have been revived. Life would have came into him. And from that life, he could have started to lead his family and others into the kingdom. So there would have been a certain amount of revival that would have took place. So I ask you the question, what if you sell out? Would it make a difference if you were to give away all your money and there all your stuff? You see, I don't think in the New Covenant that that's a big deal one way or the other. I mean, money is good and we need, we need money to run the church, but what if we, we can't afford to keep the church open? Does that change anything? Does that change me as a Christian? Would that change you as a Christian if you couldn't keep your lights on? What if you didn't have any heat for the wintertime? You know, would that make that big of a difference in the light of who you are as a person? You see, if this man would have sold out, he would have become up under persecution. You see, would that have made a difference? Would that have made him walk away from Jesus because he would have been persecuted? Are we serving the Lord just because we have stuff? We want to be prosperous.
You see, there's a lot in this story here, but the question remains, what if, what if you were to sell out the way Jesus wanted this young, this young guy, this rich young ruler to sell out? What difference would that have made in you? Well, for certain, you wouldn't have to be concerned about some of the things you own and taking care of those things because now you have, you have given them away, you see or you've sold them and now you've given your money to the poor. Now you're on the streets. Now you don't have a place to live. You don't have a car to drive. You don't have property to have to cut the grass. Would that make a big deal? Is that what the new covenant is all about? Well, I don't think it's about that particularly. Maybe God might move upon you or upon me to, to do something like that. But I think it has to do with our heart. I think it has to do with how cluttered our heart is and what we need to get rid of inside of ourselves. That is what would be more important to understand what true belief, true treasure is inside of us. The second thing is, what if the man who built bigger barns to store his food would have given the extra food to feed the hungry? Would that have brought revival to the nation? Now what story am I talking about? Some of y'all know already. In Luke 12 it says, Then he told a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my, all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So what if this guy would have said, whoa, man, God has blessed me abundantly. Now... He's not saying to go empty the bonds he already has, but he's saying, I take that excess, that extra, and then I go feed the hungry. You know, that food would have lasted for what? Man, with the amount of hungry people out there, maybe one or two days, you know, then it would have been wiped out. And then he would have had to wait for the next harvest before he would have that excess once again. You see, so there's more to the story if you really look into it. Like, as he, give, as he has given away all his excess, he would have been still eating on the other stuff, so now he's depleting that. You see, so by next harvest, he'll replace that. Then he could give away the excess. Well, what does this mean to us here spiritually? What does it say to us? You know, sometimes we, we hang on to things which we don't even know if we're going to need in the future. And I think that we need to, if we're going to see revival within our own soul, just like the rich young ruler, if this guy would have understood who gave him the, 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 the surplus to begin with, who blessed his fields, it was God. You know, and so we need to, in the new covenant, as being new covenant people, we need to understand where our source is coming from. And we need to understand that we could give it all away and God will provide spiritually God will give us what we need he will he's always promised to be our Jehovah Jireh our provider he wants to take care of every need but there's a way in which he wants to work this into our lives you know sowing and reaping it says in Galatians whatsoever man sows that also shall he reap if we sow to the flesh we're gonna reap corruption but if we sow to the spirit we reap eternal life you know so whatever we're sowing so he's, he's trying to teach us and get this into us that we shouldn't be so focused in on our own worlds and what we own and how much we have and, and, and about our retirement and so forth. We need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. If there's going to be true revival in our soul, we need to be listening and talking to God about what he has given us our, our riches for. You know, I mean, I'm not a rich man. But I do have money extra to give and to bless. I can't do a whole lot of it, but I do what I feel in my heart the Lord's telling us to do. Some people have more money that they can bless, and they, and they probably do. I don't know. Only God knows that. And some don't have much of anything, but believe it or not, they could still give, like the lady with the two pennies. 
She gave everything. She put the, two, the whole two pennies in there. You know, there's a, there's a secret in the Word of God that people really need to understand. And that is, is that when you sow, you will reap. And you need to put your faith in the truth of God's Word. I think the abundance that this man experienced had to do with God had given him a, a fertile ground. God had blessed him with, with the ability to sow and have an abundance. You know, we need to all connect with that. You know, God has given us all this fertile soil to, to sow into. And when we do so, when we give, we got to give as if we're giving to Jesus. You know, Matthew 25, it says that, when you gave to the poor man, you were given to me. When you visit them in prison, you were visiting me. They said, when, Lord, did we give to you? Well, it's when you did it to the least of these. So whenever we do anything, if, you know, we need to do it to and for Christ. And, uh, and then that is fertile soil. And then it will give you a bumper crop. You will have excess. Now, maybe it will materialize, materialize in finance or something. But it might materialize in the ability to pray with, with fervency and power. That, you will, that people, that their souls will be saved. We can't break their free will. If they don't want to be saved, that's, that's up to them. But we can pray in such a way that we can become more powerful in our praying. That the, the people that we're praying for will be shook to the foundation. They will have some understanding inside of them that they need Jesus Christ as their Savior. This would be greater riches than anything you could ever have. And that's what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. He said, give it all away. You know, give it to the poor. Sell it. Give the money to the poor. And you'll have riches in heaven. You'll have revelation. You'll have truth. And you'll understand that I will sustain you. I will take care of you. Your faith will increase. So I see the, his crops had increased here, and he wanted to hoard it all to himself. Well, if my faith increase, it's to be given away. It's like the story of where, G, where they said, increase our faith. And Jesus said, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you'd say this mountain be removed. So it doesn't take a whole lot of faith to cause a mountain to be plucked up and thrown into the ocean. But that little mustard seed can grow into a huge plant and where the birds, of the birds of the field will come and lodge in it. You know, so our faith will grow and, and it is, it's, it's planted in fertile ground of God's truth. It will grow. And then that growth, you see, will cause people to come and they will begin to lodge in your faith. And you'll be able to feed them. You'll be able to feed them with God's truth. People say, I, just, I, I, I would love to be able to be a teacher, but I just don't know what to teach. Well, God will give you what to teach. God will un unlock the truth that he's got inside of you. Everyone can teach someone, even if it's a child, a teenager, someone. And if, if you're running out of things to teach, I, I come to that place too. I really didn't know what I was going to teach with this message. And I thought, well, maybe I won't teach a message this time. And then I just stopped last night and I went to bed and, and uh, this morning, you know, I, before I even went to bed, I started having this message begin to materialize inside my soul. So when I woke up, I knew what I was going to teach on. So it didn't take me long to put it down on PowerPoint. The treasures of heaven, you see, began to rain down into your soul and give you things to teach, give you things to touch lives with. It's not all about finance, people. We're in a new covenant. Finance is just a little piece of it. Financial prosperity is just a little piece of it. You see, health is a little piece of it. You know, it's like an entire body. My hand is not the whole body. It's just a piece of this whole body. And with my whole body being in good health, I function. I can, I can then help people in other ways rather than opening my wallet every time they're asking for money. I can teach them something. I can teach them faith. You see, all of this is a picture right here. You see, all this food, this excess that came in was not for him to hoard. It was for him to give away. Then he died that night, and everybody came in and took all the food that was there, and there was nothing left. 
No one there to sow it anymore. His life was over with. People lived on that for a few days, and it was over and done with. So, you know, but our treasure can live on. Our, the truth of our life can live on in our loved ones. The third thing is, what would have happened if King Agrippa had believed Paul and became a Christian? Would that have brought revival to the nation? Maybe it did. Some of y'all might know who King Agrippa is. Well, Paul had been arrested. Now he's standing before the, the king. And, he's, and he has spoken before the governor and so forth. But now the king has come and he's listening to Paul as Paul begins to defend himself. And he goes in in Acts 26. It says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe because he was a Jewish man. <clears throat> then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Did he ever become a Christian? I don't know if it's even written whether he did or not. And if he didn't, then he's in hell right now. But he said, you almost persuade me. And Paul said, I would, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. He was in prison. He had chains on him. You know, but he said, not these chains, but as I am, a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. But here Agrippa says, you almost persuade me. Uh, what if Agrippa would have, man, got off his, his high horse, that throne he was sitting on, you know? He was sitting on a, a, a high level. He was dressed up, you know, just all in his fancy clothes, and, and he was king, and he was proud of it. But what if he would have got off of that and literally... Stepped down by Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? And the two of them together got on their knees saying, and you know, he humbled himself before God. What would have happened to the nation of Israel? It might have got him killed. He might not have been any good. But yet God maybe could have used this king in such a way. What about all the, the kings and the presidents and, and all the high officials that's all over this world and all of those that have lived before us? And maybe before the Lord comes, all of those that will come after them. What if they ushered a, a new revival into our country? What if the next president, man, just ushers in a new revival in our country? You see, if he, if he comes, and comes to the Lord, well, first off, a president like that would come under attack by the people that don't want to believe in Christ. Jesus came under attack of the Pharisees and so forth. You know, so, but what if Agrippa would have became a Christian? He might have influenced a lot of people. He might have had an impact. Would that have brought revival? I don't know. Because I don't know if true revival can be brought in by people. You see, but what would have happened? What if? So I can go into a lot of what ifs, you know. I could use many stories in the Bible to make my point. But the truth is, the timing of revival belongs to God. He decides when to send revival. God is looking for people who are seeking him with all their hearts. So, what, what does it take for a real revival to break out? I heard about one revival that broke out years ago, and I heard about the people that were involved in prayer before that revival. How they were fasting and seeking God. And if, I, if I'm mistaken, I'm not even going to tell you which revival. So, but I, it, was, it was years that they were praying for revival. I think it was something like eight years before revival hit. And it lasted for a couple of years. And, and, and many, many people came around to that revival and, and got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And a great outpouring was taking place. And there's been revivals throughout history of great revivals and outbreaks of the Holy Spirit. You know, Azusa Street, the beginning of the Pentecostal movement back in, uh, what, 1908 or whenever it was up in that time frame, you know, and, and, and they came forth and here we are today and with uh, Assemblies of God, Church of Christ, Church of God, uh, and many more that was born out of that revival that is still going on today. But what did it take? Well, they, they were praying, they were fasting, they were seeking God. They were pouring themselves into it. Now, did God honor men and women? I'd say yes, he does. God does honor God's people when they seek God with their whole heart. Here in Jeremiah 29, 13, 
They were in Babylon, and uh, the Lord said, if you look for me wholeheartedly, if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. So it's an interesting statement. If you want to go and look at the whole story in there, and Jeremiah, they, uh, Jeremiah was telling them they were going to be taken off to Babylon, and they finally they did. But Jeremiah writes in, in chapter 29, a word from the Lord, that when you're there in captivity, if you will seek me with your whole heart, you will find me, and I will bring you back to this promised land. So they did. Our Daniel was one of those captives, and, and three times a day he would stop and face where the temple was from Babylon, and, and he would pray. And they had other men and women of God that, that was seeking God, and finally God brought them back. Nehemiah, Ezra, and, and many others he brought back to rebuild the temple. That was the second temple, you know. But if you look for me, if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. That's a scripture for anybody. If we want to see that today, we're going to need to seek him with our whole heart. Now, God only needs one person. I mean, does he, does he really need a person? Well, he chooses to use a person. He used Moses. He used many men and women of God, King David, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah. And I can go on and on. Many prophets of old, he would raise them up to speak to Israel. He's raising up men and women today. Some are false prophets, but some are true. And he's raising up people today that's speaking to this country that's speaking to the government, that is speaking the word of God. He only needs one person. He doesn't need an army of people, and that's my point. All he needs is you. All he needs is me. He just needs a person. Here in Ezekiel 22, it says, So I sought for a man, you could say man or woman, among them who would make a wall. A wall is a protective shield to protect a city or whatever. And stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. He was just looking for one person to get in that gap. Now, what is the gap? Well, you make a wall, and then you have a gate. Now, that gate, it can open and close, and it takes a man or woman to open and close that gate. And, you know, he was looking for someone that would open the gate for God and close it for the enemy and stand in that gap and be, a, and be a sentry of God to keep anything else from coming in. And he was looking for that kind of person that would open the gates for revival, that would, that would be in such a position inside their heart and their soul that revival would find its way in through that gate. You know, Jesus in, Matt, in uh, John 10, he said he was the gate to the sheepfold. He is our good shepherd, it talks about, but he said he is that gate that allows the, the sheep in and out. Well, God is, is saying here, I'm looking for a person to be that gate. That person that is wholeheartedly sold out to God, that my presence can come in and the evil things can stay out. That would be a voice in the wilderness, a voice that is speaking, just like John the Baptist, who was in the spirit of Elijah. You know, he was speaking, making the way straight for the Lord until the Lord came. You know, he was, he was getting the people ready for the Messiah. You know, it says in, in Malachi what, 4, talking about the, Elijah would truly come. And, and set the pace and, and get the road straight. And he preached with such an anointing on his life that people came. And people got baptized for the remission of sin in the water. John the Baptist baptized them. You know, getting ready for Christ. Who would come? Well, you know, God's looking for a man or a woman. Someone, someone that would be, you know, would pull away from the prosperity of this world would sell out to God with their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Is that possible? I think it is. I think that God already knows such a person to, to move on by his spirit and cause these things to happen. And I believe there is a person, maybe more than one, that is crying out for revival. Maybe they've been crying out for years. They've been fasting and praying. It seems to be getting worse. But maybe the time is going to be this coming year. I don't know. We'll just have to see. Let me ask you a question. What would you, what would you want 
2023 to look like? You know, talking to all the church and everybody and Christians, uh, and especially those that are actually watching this, but what would we want this year to look like? Do you want to see prosperity come back to America? That would be nice, huh? Problem is, with prosperity like that is people tend to quit going to church and start enjoying their finances, going on vacations and going on places and buying things that they have to take care of. So is this re would this really be a picture of revival? You know, to see prosperity come back to the way it once was. Uh, do you want lower gas and food prices? Well, that would be great. Gas prices to be lower and we'd have more money. Would we spend it on ourselves? Probably so. Buying more junk that we don't need. Going more places that we really don't need to be gone. You know, but is this what we see? Revival. What, do we think that's what revival in our country would look like? Gas prices coming back down to like, say, a dollar and ten cents or something like that. And, and food prices that come down to prices that was like 20 years ago. And that would be awesome. That'd give us more money in our pockets. And <clears throat> people will be able to, to eat and drive their cars and, and go further <clears throat> and buy more food. They'll be able to buy more junk food to eat, which wouldn't be good. How about do you want to see the violence in the world come to an end? <clears throat> now, that would be commendable. You know, I would want to see 2023 that the war in Ukraine would end and the other violent places of this world, that those kind of things would end, that the violence here in our country and the hatred and the bigotry and the anti-Semitism and all of that that's taking place right now in the world and in our country, that all of that would end. But let me tell you, that would be a hopeful prayer, wouldn't it? But it's just not going to happen because wickedness is abounding and it's going to continue into the tribulation time. But I think we could see a revival to such a place that it would all calm down and many souls would be won. That's the kind of revival that I would be kind of looking for. But do you think that uh, this would be nice for 2023? I think so. I think out of all three of them, this would be the nicest thing to see, you know. The hope of all of this lies within the church. Inside of us, God has the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is within, he said in the book of Luke. And in and, and the book of Luke, it says that, you know, it says that we have to die to ourselves in order for a seed to bear much fruit. You know, so there's a lot of things the scripture tells us about um, what needs to happen. And God has put that ability within the church, okay? Inside of the church is everything we need to produce what is needed to fulfill the Great Commission. Well, you know, if we would just get back to that Great Commission, if we would just turn back to God with our whole heart, then maybe some of this will happen. Maybe uh, the country would become prosperous again, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't get hooked on its prosperity, but into worship and praise of our Lord and Savior. Revival begins with the church. So if it's within the church, then it's got to begin with us because it's where revival is contained. You know, we got revival when we got saved. You know, when, we got, when I got saved, man, life came into me. I was rejoicing. I was wanting everybody to get saved. I was living such a life. And then I went into what I call the dark ages, which we all seem to go into, the wilderness, where we kind of like give up, you know, we, we're trying to get everybody saved and our families are rejecting us and everything else and our friends don't even want us around anymore. And so we tend to start calming down. But I want to see that revival break loose, that the fire gets intense, that, you know, the joy of our salvation returns, like Psalm 51, you know, restore to us the joy of our salvation where we turn away from sin and the church begins to, to become the church that Jesus died for. You know, this is, it's all inside of us and this revival is going to begin with us. And if it doesn't begin with you or me, then where will it begin? We're not going to find it in this world. I see the church searching for happiness in this world when the true happiness is always and will continue to be Jesus Christ and in him and in his word. In 2 Corinthians 6, it says, 
And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the Lord is telling us, you know, we have become too much into the world. The worldliness has gotten into the church. I mean, we celebrate the holidays right along with the world. We don't care what it is. We just get, we just looking to be happy some kind of way. And so once we start shifting to being happy in this world, then the happiness with the Lord will fade. You can't serve two masters, it says. You know, you can't serve God in money. Jesus Christ God has got to be our source of our happiness, joy, and peace, and our finance, too. You cannot over here think that, oh, if I, do, I get some more money in the bank, I'll be a happier person. No, you won't. You just, you're going to need more and more and more and more, and it's never going to satisfy. And everybody's going to want your money, and on and on it goes. But true happiness is the Lord. And contentment comes with that for what you do have to be content. And when you begin to start doing the things that Jesus wants us to do, that's when you really, truly will find that happiness that never leaves. And then when you die, you'll have this, this reward and riches in heaven waiting on you there. So we need to separate from this world. Some people think that they are separated. We really need our eyes open. We really need to see just how naked and how sickly we are as a church. You know, you just have to take that big step back and take a look and you can see it. You know, where are the Elijahs today? Where are the, you know, the Elishas, you know, today? Where are the, 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 the spirits of the prophets of old, the Holy Spirit? Where is that outpouring of Pentecost? Where is that giving and taking care of one another and loving each other? Where is that? You go on YouTube and there may have tons of videos attacking one denomination to attacking the other. Where's the love? You know, where's, where, where is the edification that we need? Where is it? You know, I want this year as a minister, I want my messages to revolve around wanting people to have a relationship with God, to carry that light, to have that anointing on them. I want to see the people in my church, I want to see their loved ones that they, that they need to be saved start coming to church with them and start understanding and start wanting to. That would be revival to me. You see, what do, what do we want for this year? So, will revival come in 2023? I don't know. But I know where it begins. Talk, we just talked about it. It begins, it begins with you, it begins with me, it begins with somebody, you know, and we need somebody in some church to really break out in revival, and, and then the rest of us to not get jealous over it. You know, I'm just reminded of the prodigal story, when the prodigal finally came home, and the son heard the partying going on, the dad killed the fattest, fatted calf, and invited everyone, and because the son that once was dead is now alive. Well, the older son got jealous over that. He should have rejoiced right with everyone else because he knew his brother was out in the world and needed salvation. But instead, he was condemning his brother. And he was like, whoa, you didn't kill a fatted calf for me, you know, for me to get my friends together and have a party. And the dad said, man, we could have done that at any time. All of this is yours. Your, your brother already spent his inheritance. But all of this is yours. This is all belongs to you. Understand that your brother was dead and now he's alive. This is a true revival spirit when the church realizes that the world out there is dying and going to hell. And we need to sell out for them. We need to be the food that they need. We need to be the source that brings them to Christ. We are the ones that they look at and they see. 
God looks on the heart, but they look on the outward. Does our outward appearance, is it holy? Is it righteous? You see, we need to be revived. We need to have that life radiating right out of our flesh. That the people will be drawn to it. That they won't, you know, that they won't be looking for the shortest services in the parish, in the state, in the world. Oh, I'm going to go to this one because it's only 45 minutes long. You know, we'll be looking for services that feed the soul. You know, if souls getting touched. I want our services to be that way. I want our people in our church to be revived. I want to see it in such a way that, you know, it doesn't matter how long or short the service is. They're coming for Christ. They're coming to be fed by Him. They're coming to, to have a relationship. That's true revival to me. I need to be revived so my church can be revived. I put all the blame on myself. I put the blame on myself for my family not being revived if they're not. I put my blame on myself. We can't be shrugging it off. We can't be blaming the YouTube videos. We can't be blaming other ministers and what they're talking about and what's going on in the church. I say things that's going on, but I don't blame anyone except myself. You know, we have to point the finger back at ourselves. It's resting in us, beginning with you, beginning with me. I want to revive you, and I want you to revive me. You know, we're looking for that source of revival. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take a heart with passion and love. It's going to take a mind that thinks continuously on the Lord. I will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon me, the Lord said. A heart that, that runs hard after the Lord, that waits patiently upon a moving of God's Spirit. And then ready and waiting, but busy serving the Lord. Ready in season and out of season to tell of that hope. That's the kind of revival I want. I want to see 2023 is a greater year than any year yet. The best is yet to come, and I believe so. I believe that I want to, even if I had a great year last year, which I did have a good year, but if I had a great year, I would be looking for a much greater year this year. I don't want to be content. I want to move forward for God. I want to be moving forward for God. Amen? So, Father, right now, I just give you all the praise. I pray for everyone that is listening. I just lift them up, and I pray that they would have a desire to move forward, a desire to be, to be anointed, to sit in your presence like Mary did, and not be so busy about this world. So I lift them all up who are listening, and I pray for your touch in Jesus' name. Amen.